Welcome to the Hindustan video lecture series. My name is Abhi Koshi and I am from the Electrical and Electronics Engineering Department. I will be speaking on some basics of instrumentation. Instrumentation is basically a science of instruments and measurements, measuring instruments. And obviously every single branch of engineering needs to have measured values of various parameters. So a basic understanding of how an instrument works is very useful for any engineer. We have, all of us, have seen at least two types of instruments. The analog instrument where you have a pointer running over a graduated scale and the more modern digital instruments. Obviously, the earlier instruments were all analog. Now, an analog instrument will give you an output which varies continuously over the range of the scale. From zero to the full-scale deflection, you could show you an infinite number of values. Digital instruments, on the other hand, show you the result in discrete steps. So you could only have a finite number of values which are being displayed, not measured. It could be measuring anything, but it can display only a finite number of values. My talk is going to be basically on the analog instrument. Now, an analog instrument, as we know, typically has a pointer which moves over a scale. So to move the pointer, you need a torque. A torque is a twisting force which creates the movement. Now, we also know that when current flows through a conductor, it sets off a lot of other effects. You have electromagnetic fields coming because of the current flow. You have electrostatic fields because of the current flow. And if you have two conductors carrying current, you have uh, induction between them. Two conductors carrying current will have an electrodynamic effect. Now, each of these effects are used to make different types of instruments for different purposes. We have a series of instruments called a moving coil instrument, where the basic torque for moving the pointer is given by a coil, a coil which is suspended between the ends of a horseshoe magnet. Now, some of these types of instruments can be used only for DC measurements. There are other classifications of instruments which can be used only for AC. For example, an induction, um, an instrument working on an induction principle can be used only for AC measurements. Whereas, uh, electrostatic instrument or an electrodynamic instrument can be used for AC and DC. So depending upon what you're trying to measure, you need to choose an appropriate instrument. Now, if you're trying to measure something like, for example, the uh, atmospheric pressure, and you want to display that on a scale, obviously the electrical instrument will not going to pick it up. So you need to have a transducer which converts this mechanical pressure into an electrical signal. The electrical signal in turn gets read by the meter. So that is a subject by itself, transducers, so we will not be going into that. Another way of classifying instruments would be uh, 
you have indicating instruments, like the typical voltmeters, ammeters, multimeters that you see lying around. They are all indicating instruments where you have a pointer moving over a calibrated scale. You could have recording instruments, which will give a continuous record of whatever value you're measuring. For example, supposing you are controlling or you are having a industrial furnace for doing the heat treatment of some components. You have to bring the component up to a particular temperature over a period of time, hold it at the temperature for another period of time, and then cool it again over a period of time. Now, the temperature is important, the time is important, and the resultant quality of the component will depend upon these parameters. So for record purposes, most organizations maintain a record, a paper graph record of the temperature and the time. This is just one example which I gave for a recording kind of an instrument. Now, say the energy meter in the house, the instrument, the meter which tells how many units you have consumed. They are, they are instruments which measure the total quantity of whatever, which has been delivered over a period of time. So these types of instruments are called integrating instruments. Now, this is three very broad classifications of instruments. In any analog instrument, say an indicating type of instrument especially, the uh, effect of the measurement, measurement is the quantity that you are going to measure, is converted into a mechanical torque which is applied onto the pointer, and it moves the pointer across a calibrated scale. So now, for the total instrument to work, you need various subsystems. The first, obviously, is the deflecting system, which is what creates the pointer to move. Now, the pointer has started moving, fair enough. Where does it stop? And once it has stopped, what brings it back to zero? So you have one more system called a controlling system, which produces a controlling torque opposite to the deflecting torque. This will, at, when these two torques are in equilibrium, it will bring the pointer to a stop. So if I'm measuring a signal of 15 volts, I will not end up reading 25 volts. And as soon as my input signal is removed, the controlling torque brings the pointer back to zero. Now with any system, there will be oscillations. By which I mean, you have the pointer moving because of the deflecting torque. You have the controlling torque which will stop it at a certain point. Now the stop is not a full stop, it will swing. And you have to wait until all these oscillations stop before you can take a good reading. So you need some sort of a method to dampen these oscillations. And simple example of a damping system is the shock absorbers in your motorbike. If the shock absorber is not there, you would be jerking all the time. Now, in the deflecting system, the torque which is produced for the deflection is proportional to the quantity to be measured. Now, the force which is generated should be high enough to overcome any inertia in the system so the moving parts should be as light as possible. It should overcome the controlling torque which is trying to bring it back. And it should overcome the damping torque 
which is which you have to provide to stop the oscillations. Now, various uh, electrical phenomena are used to create the damping, the uh, deflecting torque. You could have a magnetic effect, which is that when a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field, it experiences a force. So this fundamental principle can be used to operate or generate the deflecting torque. You could use a thermal effect where the current being measured heats up something and you use a thermocouple to convert that heat, that temperature rise into a EMF. So the thermocouple in this case will act like a uh, transducer converting a non-electrical quantity temperature into an electrical quantity and EMF. Now, instruments like galvanometers, which are essentially used to sense the presence of a current, not to measure the current, the value of the current, but just to sense the, measure, the presence of a current, are typically working on an electrostatic principle. We know that when you have two charged plates near each other, then they experience a force. Force could be either attractive or repulsive. Now, if one of these plates is movable, we can translate that movement into an indication. You could also have instruments working on an induction principle. If you have an alternating, alternating magnetic field and you have a non-magnetic but electrically conductive disk placed in this magnetic field and moving, the magnetic field, alternating magnetic field will be inducing an EMF in the disk. This induced EMF in turn creates an induced current. And that induced current will be generating its own little magnetic field. These two magnetic fields will interact and produce a torque, a force, which will move the disk. This is the principle which is used in the energy meter in your house. If you look at the, uh, not the modern digital ones, but the older ones where you can see a disk moving. This is the one. More modern instruments could be using uh, something like the Hall effect. A Hall effect is if you're having a current carrying bar of some, some semiconductor material placed in a magnetic field, an EMF is generated between two edges of the material. And the magnitude of this EMF depends upon the flux density of the field. So if you have a Hall effect uh, semiconductor and you place it in a magnetic field, the EMF which is generated because of the Hall effect is proportional to the magnetic field. So this is a straightforward, easy way of measuring the intensity of the field. So instruments like flux meters, which are used to measure the magnetic flux density, work on this principle. So we have seen uh, some of the phenomena which drive the deflecting system. Now we'll have a look at the controlling system. The controlling system, as I said, is the system which provides the force that governs the deflection of the pointer and makes sure that the deflection is proportional to the magnitude of the input, to the magnitude of the measurement. If there was no controlling system, the pointer would swing beyond its final position and the deflection and therefore the reading would be wrong. Also, the pointer would never come back to its zero position. So the basic requirements for the controlling system are that it should provide a force 
equal and opposite to the deflecting force so that it makes the deflection uh, definite mm -hmm. deflection and bring the pointer back to zero position when the deflecting force is removed. Two of the common systems being used are gravity control and spring control. Uh, gravity control is, uh, the control is given by a small weighted arm which is fixed onto the pointer. If you look at the slide, you can see the, the pointer and the weighted arm with, weighted arm is basically a arm with a small weight at the end. Now the amount of controlling torque produced by this counterweight system can be adjusted by either changing the weight or adjusting the length of the arm, active arm. Changing the length of the active arm is much easier because in that case all you need is a threaded rod and you can screw the weight up or down. Now again you can see in the slides, there's a little bit of animation on that. If the system deflects through an angle phi, the control weight and the arm will also be swinging through the same angle. Now when the arm, control arm moves through an angle from the vertical position, the weight is acting downwards because of gravity, but this force gets resolved into a sine component which will be acting such as to bring the pointer back. Now in equilibrium position, the deflecting torque will be equal to the controlling torque because that is when the pointer is going to come to a stop. So now the deflecting torque is proportional to the input current. While the uh, deflecting torque is pr proportional to sine of the angle that through which it has moved. So ultimately, the measured current is proportional to sine of the angle. So the angle, which means the deflection, is proportional to the current. Now the complication here is this sine factor, sine of the angle. Now because of that, the scale of a gravity control device is not uniform. This can be a nuisance. However, the advantages of a gravity control is that it is very simple, mechanically very, very simple, and that makes it very cheap. And uh, the performance is not dependent upon temperature, time, and other factors. And it's very easy to adjust the controlling torque by varying the position of the weight. On the other hand, the disadvantages are that the no, of the non-uniform scale, which makes it quite difficult to read accurately. Second problem is that the system must be used vertically because we are depending on gravity. And it must be leveled properly. Otherwise, the forces do not get resolved in the way we want. So you, obviously you cannot use this for a portable instrument because you can't take such an instrument to the field and then try and keep it vertical and absolutely leveled and all that. So because of all these kinds of limitations, the more generally used system is the spring control. Here, the restoring force is provided by a non-magnetic spiral spring, typically made of phosphor bronze. Now, this spring is mounted on the shaft of the pointer. Spiral spring is like the spring in your watch on the clock. Now, when the pointer deflects, the spring gets twisted in the opposite direction. So, it'll, the spring will be trying to restore the pointer in other words, 
the twist on the spring, because of the point of movement, creates the restoring torque, which is proportional to the angle of twist. So again, the controlling equations can be seen on the slide. And since the deflecting torque is directly proportional, you ha can have a uniform scale. The uh, limitation here is that the spring should have a few very, very important characteristics. It should be non-magnetic. It should be free from mechanical stresses. Otherwise, the spring characteristic will not be linear. Every spring has something called a spring constant. And ideally, the spring constant should be linear. However, if the spring has been manufactured, improperly manufactured, there will be mechanical stresses which will give it a non-linear characteristic. And the spring, should, the material use of the spring should have a low temperature coefficient so that its characteristics do not change appreciably with temperature. The slide also shows a comparative between various comparative indicators between a gravity control and spring control. Now, the, we have spoken about the deflecting torque and the controlling torque. And the, what's remaining is the damping system. So once again, the deflecting torque produces the deflection. Controlling torque acts in the opposite direction so as to make the deflection proportional to the magnitude of the input. Now, when, even though you do that, the pointer will always oscillate about its equilibrium position. And you have to wait for the oscillations to die down or to stop before you can take a sensible reading. So we need to provide a damping system to damp the oscillations and bring the pointer to a rest as soon as possible. Now, the damping system must provide a damping torque only when the moving system is moving. And it must not affect the deflecting system or the controlling system, and it should not add on to friction and other such effects. So what we need to do is have a damping torque which is proportional to the velocity of the moving system something which is absolutely independent from the input, but depends upon how the speed at which the pointer moves, speed at the velocity at which the pointer moves. Now, I'm sure you've already done some of these terminologies like under damping, over damping, critically damping. What we need is a critically damped system. That means the moving system reaches its final position quickly and smoothly without oscillations. So that type of a condition is called a critically damped. And a sort of a comparative graph between the three types of damping can be seen on the slide. Now generally, this type of a damping torque is given by either air damping, fluid damping, or eddy current damping. In air damping and fluid damping, what we have is a, a closed a cylinder with a piston. The piston is fixed onto the pointer, pointer system. And the cylinder, the chamber, will be filled either with air or with oil. So as the, the pointer moves, the piston will be going in or out of the chamber and it will be acting against whatever fluid, whether it is air or a liquid, will be getting either compressed in one direction or the other. And the pressure change because of this compression provides the damping. Since this kind of a compression happens during both directions of the piston movement, the oscillations and overshoots and things like that get drastically reduced. 
But the most effective damping method is what we call the eddy current damping. Now, eddy current damping makes use of the principle that when a conductor moves in a magnetic field, an EMF is induced in it. This induced EMF creates an induced current, which in turn creates a magnetic field opposing the, create, the creating field. This follows from Faraday's law and Lenz's law. Now, typically, an aluminum disc is mounted on the spindle of the pointer and it is arranged in such a way that the disc moves between the jaws of an open magnet. So a disc moves between the jaws of the magnet. When the disc turns, it oscillates. It cuts the magnetic flux and the induced eddy currents oppose this movement. In other words, it opposes the oscillations. And the pointer therefore comes quickly to an rest. So we have seen a basic overview on some of the instrument fundamentals. In the next series, we can go a little deeper into what really is inside an instrument, physically. In the meantime, if you have any queries or like to know more, please do contact us on our email address. Thank you.